Uh, so welcome to our May edition of Papers We Love Nairobi. Today we are privileged to have uh, Victor Kironde taking us through uh, this paper on uh, LSTM-based online handwriting coordination. Uh, I think as far as I know about it, it's uh, what is used on Gboard, if you use the Google keyboard on your phones. Uh, so I think we're going to learn a lot about it. Uh, uh, Victor is a software engineer at Microsoft, and also a good friend of mine. We, <laughs> he has so many ideas around. Mm -hmm. He's like a, a pen, pen nut. <laughs> Uh, so I think you're going to enjoy this session. Uh, so welcome, Victor. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll I'll jump right in. Um, oh, so sorry, sorry for the interruption. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Do you want people to? Uh, ask questions do as you continue, or they can ask at the end. Um, at the end might be better. Okay, at the end. Okay, at, good. At the end. Good. Good. Um, good. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll try. I'll try to to scope it in uh, to leave some time at the end for questions and discussions. And if you have anyone has read the paper before, to add any contribution or emphasis on something that they think stood out. Yeah, it'll be interesting if someone else has read the paper from the time you shared. <laughs> anyway, um, I'll start then. So my name is Victor Chironde, and as Nanda said, I'm a software engineer with, uh, with Microsoft. Um, I am going to be discussing this paper. It's a paper on, on online language, uh, online handwriting recognition. We, we'll talk about what that means. Uh, it's called, and you can turn the screen, Fast Multi Language LSTM Based Online Handwriting Recognition. It's written by this, the people I've listed here, and uh, they're from Google. At least at the time of the writing, they were writing this paper for Google. And this work is used in Google's handwriting recognition, most uh, specifically in the Gboard app, which is Google's keyboard for Android devices. Um, yeah, so this is the paper. Um, so why why handwriting recognition? I'll talk a bit about why why I care about handwriting recognition, and uh, why why it's interesting. Handwriting recognition is is a, a sort of a popular ML research area. Uh, it's basically the problem you're solving is how do you convert uh, handwrit handwritten text to to text like the text as we know it, that, that a computer can interpret. And uh, there are two forms of that. One is what we call offline hand, handwriting recognition, which is, for example, if you, if you took a, if you, if you wrote down in a book, a physical book, and then you took a photograph of that, you could pass that through a machine learning model, and then the output is the text, the past text that can now be, understood in other contexts other than the visual context. Now that would be offline because the, you first wrote everything that you, you needed to write and then you, you applied a model to that uh, and got the text out. Now the online version, which is what you're going to talk about, is is uh, real time. So as you write, um, the text the text is being passed by a machine learning model as in, in real time. So, I mean, let me see if, this, if you can see this. Um, this is not the starting slide, but it's also so. This is what you're looking at. If, if the video can play back uh, on on the screen share, that is an example of, of real-time handwriting recognition. And here we're using 
the model we're going to be discussing, the paper we're going to be discussing is actually the work that, that is enabling this. This is Gboard on Android. Okay. Now, needless to say, I'm not, I'm not representing Google or Microsoft <laughs> or the people who wrote this paper in this talk. Um, in case, in case I misrepresent any of those, uh, these are my opinions. <laughs> but, but um, you can look up, you can look up the the various authors and the paper itself. You could look into it and see, uh, and and read it on your own if you haven't done so far. Okay. So an overview how the, and how the paper is structured. We shall go through an introduction of how how they go about solving this problem the online uh, language uh, rather i keep saying like, online handwriting recognition and then how the end-to-end -end model architecture is structured how it's trained the experiments and and the performance so just from the title the, the specific problem that they're solving where well, this paper solves is speed so traditionally, how handwriting recognition is done is uh, uh, a kind of model called segment and decode, which which takes uh, you you basically get the the input as as uh, strokes, and then you you segment it. So you try to you use heuristics to try and get the different parts of the text. So for example, if this is the text, you'd be splitting the whole thing into chunks and then you you feed those you feed those into a machine learning model uh, to try and, and, and understand the text now that's that gets slow why it is slow is because uh, if for example you get the text is represented as, a, as an image so someone wrote down and then you get this image and you're trying to feed this image into the machine learning model and then you start trying to cut it into pieces, the arbitrary pieces, because you wouldn't know where one letter begins and another ends. You you then feed that into a machine learning model to try and, and understand that. So that that turns out to be mm -hmm. slow, at least not, not not as fast as what we're going to discuss. It works for offline handwriting recognition, but for for online handwriting recognition, that that is very slow. Now, how does online handwriting recognition work? So, I'm going. I'm going to talk about the how how, how the computer how the, the computer interprets handwriting, and then how how that is later transformed into the strokes that are input. So here, um, one second. So this is let's say this is this is a canvas, a digital canvas. Uh, when you write when you write anything on 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 any screen, uh, you will how how it works how this works when you when you're drawing strokes on a screen is that the the computer or the system you're using. Uh, keep sampling points of your stylus or mouse or any input input device, and then and then joins them. So how how your hundred and or drawn uh, strokes are represented? They're represented as a series of points in succession. And what that looks like, you can use this up to show you. Um, so what I've drawn now is equivalent to uh, this. The difference is, one, we're using a, a, a lower sampling rate such that you can see the, the dots, and another, it's very high. So you have very many dots following each other here on the, on the yellow stroke, and um, you have fewer dots. But And so the difference between the number of dots, obviously, as you can see, is the difference in legibility, how the stroke looks, but also uh, in terms of, of representation of the data to the computer, each of these dots, and if you pick out one here, is 
at least the x y coordinates of of the of uh, of of itself on the canvas and um and you could get this just this a series of them in a vector uh and pass them to a machine learning model and you start you use it to to tr you train it to to learn that for example what i've written that's not a letter in english but if it's if it does reverse like this, for example, if you train it that the series of dots that are these that go like that are the letter S. And you do that over and over again until now it's able to learn from the, the dots, the row input dots. Now, this training data, how it's apart from the XY coordinate of the dots, the individual dots in a stroke, you also have uh, the time variable meaning. Uh, from the start of the first dot that you wrote, uh, let's say you have another dot here and another one, another one. Uh, what is the time in seconds or milliseconds of each one in relation to the other one? So this could be zero seconds and this is like a, a five seconds. It won't be five seconds. This, it will be like milliseconds or even smaller, but you get the idea. So every dot, instead of just having its X, Y, it has a, a time variable and that is very useful because we use it to to know where the stroke starts and where it ends and in the case of multi-language uh, recognition you know when you look at when you look at written text after the fact for example if, if i draw this you don't know what came first uh, you don't know how it was drawn you just know how it looks that is if you're doing offline handwriting recognition you don't know how it is written. You just know how it looks after it has been written. But how it's written is important, especially in multi-language recognition, because some languages come from the back forward. So after after they have been written, they might look the same, but how they're to be read is backwards forward. For example, let's say, let's say this one is written. I don't think it is, but let's say you read it from the, the right to the left instead of left to right. Um, if you just look at it and you don't know the language, you, you can't know that, that that is supposed to be read from left to right. But if you have the time variable, you will see that the first strokes, uh, the strokes on this side, have a, a lower time associated with them than these ones. So you would know that this, is, this comes from the left to the right. And that is relevant even in single characters, not, not the whole sentence. So that's why we have uh, a time variable like, like that. Okay, so this is how this is how handwriting is is done, or any drawing on screens for that matter, because as you know, a screen is, is a series of pixels in a grid. So, so when you interact with a screen, you're interacting with points in that space in a two D space, and computers are trying to figure out how to to associate those points with the meaning you care about. And in the case of handwriting, that meaning is actual letters, like the letter S or the letter O. And these are, for example, this could be like uh, 500, sorry, this could be like 500 or so dots in succession, like I've shown. Now, this is exactly how the training data for handwriting because online handwriting recognition is good. So you have you have people writing on on special special devices that can record the handwriting, and specifically they can record that time variable. So the training for this, the training data for this is not pictures of of handwritten text. It's actually uh, strokes that have been recorded with a time variable, and I've explained that um, a stroke is basically a series of these points. And the more you have, the the higher you the better the text looks. Okay. So what does this paper do? Um, before, before, one second, sorry. So I, I talked about uh, an older model. This paper builds on an older paper that, that was written, how handwriting is done traditionally, where you segment the input and then you feed that into a model and that it does something different. The problem with, with, with getting raw points 
uh, and feeding them directly to, to a machine learning model and why it is slow is, is described in the, in the paper. And I look at this. Um, right, what I've been, what I've been describing is, is this section of the paper. And as you can see here, uh, they talk about having the X and Y and the T um, as points. So every single point, every single dot has this value. And then they have these other two values, which one means that uh, you're writing the pen, the pen is on the, on the canvas and then it's, it's not. Later on in the footnotes, they, they describe that they recognize the, the redundance of this. You can, you can get that information by just knowing where strokes begin and, and end. But this is what I've been describing, input representation. So the first, the first thing we can do is uh, get the row, those dots that I was showing, you can get them in succession and just uh, fit them into a model. And, but there are some, there are some drawbacks to that. But uh, before we discuss the drawbacks and, and why, and what the improvements are, we, I'll just describe this, I'll just talk about this part on some pre-processing that is done, uh, that is done to those strokes or to those points before, before they are, they're, they're sent, in, sent into the model. One of it is normalization. So the two-dimensional space that I showed, let's say this is a, a two-dimensional grid. You have your y-axis and the x, uh, and you just write anything here. Um, every point, every point on that stroke will have x and y and time and other values. But one of the things we first do is normalization, meaning we move remove that, that point so that its x value is zero. Uh, so that instead of, it, instead of, for example, if it was here, maybe the x is equal to five, but you want to shift it to the left so that it actually starts at the start. Um, that's the first thing, that's what is referred to as normalization here. So that x is zero. And then we also, for the y coordinate, we put it in the range of zero and one. The purpose of this is so that uh, because the the input representation does not record rotation. So if you wrote text like this going upwards and you wrote this one going leftwards like that, the difference isn't recorded uh, by the model or the, by the, the points in, in, in that way passing to the, to the model. So what we do to solve for that is, so this is your y-axis. And one. We we transform the, the the grid itself such that all the text only fits between the range of zero and one, right? And that's part of normalization. That is the first thing that is done in the pre-processing, and then uh, resampling, resampling of the the the, the strokes. Resampling refers to. Um, they say of the, the letter C, um, and I've said it's represented as dots like this, and very many of them will create the letter C. Depending on your input device and uh, other factors, the distances between these dots is not equal. It's not going to be equal. So the distance between, for example, that point and that point is going to be different from here. Now we don't want that because it will cause the, the machine learning model to, to learn unnecessary things also, or, or to, to misbehave. So that's another thing that, that is done before, uh, which is this, that we, we do a linear resampling of the strokes using delta point, point zero 0.05 of the length, meaning a line of length one will have 20 points. That's what I'm, that's what I'm describing here. So if you had a, a single line like this, which is, uh, Let's say its length is one. It it might have been it might have had an arbitrary number of points based arbitrarily. And what we do is we make sure they're equally 
space on that line, they still represent the same line. The only difference is the points themselves are uh, equally spaced. And that's part of the, the uh, pre-processing too. Now, why do we why do we do that at all? Um, the point the point of doing that is such that uh, we get to use Bezier curves. So Bezier curves, I'm going to explain what they are, but they're, they're sort of the main the main point of, of novelty in this paper. Everything else that is done and how the, the machine learning model works is pretty standard. It's how machine learning models that, that recognized handwritten text work. But in this case, uh, and there are specific keys of these kinds of curves that I'm going to describe, um, it's what makes the, the handwriting recognition fast. Okay. So, I've explained how how the the input is gotten. I think I think if you have a, a question about this uh, specifically, it might be better to ask now. But 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 we can discuss it later too. Anyway, so what are what are the Bezier curves? Um, they're a kind of curve that are that are used to these are Bezier curves. They're kind of curve. Curves, that is the, the, the mathematical representations of curves. But why they're interesting or why, they, or why we care about them is we're able to to represent a curve using points, points in space, like the ones you see here, P0, P1, P2, and 3. And, and we have control over how that curve looks by dragging the points around. They're, they're used in virtually everything in in computer graphics and then on the right here you see the exactly what what i used to describe font data so if you use a font format like a true type font or open type how how the the, the visual representation of the font data is done it's done using bezier curves and if you've used any kind of uh, graphics program photoshop or any painting animation 3d modeling you most likely have come across some kinds of curves. There's a high chance that those are the Z curves we are interacting with. So how do they work? Uh, they are, uh, here is a more interactive version of, of. So we have these four points in space, and you see this curve. And if I drag the points around, you see we can we can get the the point, the curve, the black line to look anyhow we want. Uh, by just moving the point. If you had to do this uh, uh, with a, a stylus or a mouse, obviously it wouldn't look very smooth and it is hard to be as precise as this. These are used for uh, describing motion in space too. For example, if you do any animation, what they call uh, easing in and easing out, or if in, in CSS when you do animation in this sigmoid curve like this, uh, it, they're, they're all described by using Bezier curves. So uh, how do they work exactly? Um, I'll show you here. It's linear interpolation between points. So if you just focus on this first one, if you have if you have a point zero and point one, two points in space, uh, you can represent their function or the, the function of the line between them uh, using another variable t. And that would be the parametric form of that function. So the question you're answering here is, if you have t that is between 0 and 1, how do you find any point? Yeah, how do you find a point that lies between these two points, given a value of t that is between 0 and 1? And how you do that is using linear interpolation. And when it's a single line, this is what it looks like animated. So as you can see uh, here, t is coming from zero to one, and then as it tends towards one, the point, the red point, and subsequently the line it's drawing comes from zero to one, and and that's the simplest version of a, a Bezier curve. And the control points in this case are zero and one. And then if you add another point p two here, now I'm, I'm focusing on the second drawing here. If you add another point like this, and you do the exact same thing as you did in the first one, 
uh, that is using the same T value and you interpolate on that line. And then the points that are being created, if you look at the, the purple line, you also run up a, a third point on them. The curve that that point is drawing is a Bezier curve. That's what it is. The visual, how it looks visually is this. Uh, and if you keep adding points, like in the third picture here, you see we have, we now have control over that curve in how it looks, what I was showing before. But the takeaway here is fundamentally it's linear interpolation of two points in, in, in a two dimensional space. It could be higher dimension in a two dimensional space. And you have a time variable that is between zero and one. And when you keep adding points, you get higher dimension of Bezier curves. So the second one here, which has up to P2, is what's called a quadratic Bezier curve because uh, if you see the mathematical representation of this curve, the highest power in the in the equation is is, is a two, which would which would give you a quadratic polynomial, and here you have a cubic polynomial and a cubic Bezier curve, and and so on. I show you the Wikipedia page too because the, the, the it shows the them in context. The same thing here. So we have the linear curve, which is the simplest, and then you have the quadratic one and higher order. The ones we care about specifically in this paper are the cubic Bezier curve, meaning this one specifically. So it has three points, uh, rather three lines and four points. So P0, P1, uh, P2, and P P3, and it's the one I've shown here. So this, there are many kinds of Bezier curves, but this specific one is the one we care about the most. The reason why the cubic one and not a lower, a lower level one or a higher level one is because uh, of its simplicity and level of expression. So if you just have a quadratic Bezier, you can't create this S curve like this, like I'm showing you, because you wouldn't have enough points to do that. And then if you have higher than this, more points than this, the value of it can still be expressed by just the cubic Bezier uh, without, without adding a lot more points uh, to work with. And the more points you'd be adding, the, the harder it will become to, to work with too. So for example, here, when you, this is a, this last image to the, to the right, because you're having more points to drag around if, if, you're, if you're interacting with them, it's harder to, to create a shape that you want. Okay. Now, that is sort of the, the what, what, what Bezier curves are. And uh, if you're interested in how they're represented mathematically, which we don't have the time to go through, uh, that's a discussion you can have offline. But so far what we've done is I've shown you how in handwriting input is, is gotten and a little on how Bezier curves work and what they are. Now, let's go back to the drawbacks of the raw, the raw inputs that we talked about, the dots in succession. One is resolution. So because of different, different devices, the resolution will be different because of the input sampling rate. I showed you that before that the same letter like C in this case, can be represented by a different set of dots in different relationships. And that difference uh, can, uh, can be problematic. So for example, this and that, they're all, they're all doing the same thing, but they, they are different. Different number of dots and different arrangement of them, not arrangement, spaces between them. And, uh, and then the length, so it's not necessarily true that the more the more dots you have, the better. Because if you if you if the if the stroke you're representing is small, uh, not small, like straight, for example, like this. So this line, if you use only two dots, if you use only two dots in space to represent it, and then you use a billion dots you are getting the same line, but obviously this is much more expensive than the two dots. 
So you want to optimize uh, for how many, because every dot as I showed you was, was a, a vector of very many points that one of them are X, Y, and time, and some other variables that we might care about. So the higher the number of them is, the worse that your performance is going to be because you're, you're dealing with much more data and the gains might be small. For example, the easiest example is a line, but if it's a line, you, if you are trying to say is line, you, you can get away just two points instead of a billion. So that is a drawback of passing raw input points just to a model. And then the model complexity uh, is also a drawback for getting a list of points in space and throwing them to a machine learning model. Because what, what the machine learning model will do is it will start uh, trying to understand it. The points, so it will try to learn those and those. It starts from the smallest to the biggest. It's trying to generalize to that shape, but it's doing it by trying to gain meaning from the the little uh, the little relationships between the the points. Now that will give you a very complex and, and a very big model after the fact. So that's why you don't want to use raw points directly and pass them into a machine learning model. What you do is you turn them into, or what this paper is doing is they turn them into Bezier curves, which I've explained. So instead of getting, instead of getting points and then, and then putting them into a model, uh, you do, you get those points. So you have this. Uh, this is now the, the point representation of the letter C, but you want to, to turn it into a curve, a Bezier curve. Um, and the value of that would be that this curve will be represented by much fewer points. Instead of the, let's say you have a uh, 100 points here, you'll only have four of them here, the red ones. You only have four of them. And uh, you have the relationship between them, the relationship being that the, the Bezier curve, what you're looking at here. For example, with these four points, I can show you. You can create something that looks like a C, like that. And obviously, this is much, much less data than the normal representation of raw points. Um, and it's also much, much more precise and useful for us when, when you're trying to optimize for speed. So how does this work? How, how do you convert, how do you convert these raw points into a Bezier curve? You do, you, you do a linear regression where you reduce the, the error. So you can put these points in a two dimensional space. Okay. Linear regression, if you have if you have points in space like this, you're trying to, to fit a line that describes them, that describes the distribution. If you did, if you did this, this line is not necessarily the one that describes that population. But uh, the same idea of how do you find the how do you how do you find the line that best describes this data? The purpose you're trying of doing that is you're trying to predict. Uh, to predict other values that, that you didn't know before. Now, in the same case, for example, in the case of a letter C, you have, you'd have those, those points, there are very many points, as the data on a grid. And then instead of trying to fit a line, like I've shown you on the left, you're trying to fit a curve. So you're trying to, to predict the curve that most accurately represents those points. Specifically, you're trying to fit a cubic, a cubic Bezier curve to that data. So that's how that's that's what is being done here. Um, and all of this is basically trying to, to explain how that is done. Um, we we normalize the time variable, the time dimension that we're getting here and so that it, it matches the, the stroke data that is the, the spatial x and y values and then 
we get the sum of squared errors. If you've done, if you're doing statistics or machine learning, this is familiar. But basically, this is a way of, of uh, you find a function that describes uh, uh, a data set, and then you try to minimize it. You try to minimize it, meaning you're finding the equation of the line that reduces the, the error, error being the difference between any single point in the space versus what is predicted. Uh, and then how you do that is, is, is precisely solving this system of linear equation. So on the left, the leftmost, we have the, the dots. Each, each, each line here is a, a single dot in the stroke. Um, and then this is the, the, the basis functions of the Bezier curves. And these are the coefficients. The coefficients are what we're, we're looking for because they describe the form of the Bezier curve. So for example, here, let me just put, this is the this is an equation of a line and the M and B are coefficients. So if I, if I, I get any values of M, you see the line is changing in space. It, it's a different line. And if I change this other one, the bias, it's also moving it up and down. It's biasing it. Sometimes this is called four lines. It's the Y intercept because you see it changes where the, the line is intersecting the, the Y axis. But this idea extends to curves too. That you have you have uh, certain variables, in this case our only variables X, and then you have the coefficients to them. And then you have an equation. Our equation for this case is the cubic base here that I've shown you. The cubic base here is here. And then you're trying to find what coefficients do we put to those to represent a curve that we want or to fit a data set correctly like here. So you're looking, you're looking for this C given represented as a cubic base here, given the set of points. And you do that by solving the error uh, and minimizing it. So that's what this is, that's what this is doing. Now after you've done that, uh, you represent the curve that you get as a set of parameters, which are shown in this image. So the distance between the start and end point, the, the tangents, the, ta the begin with D1 and the, the, the D2 tangents of the start on, on the start and end points of the curve and the angle between this line you created and the curve that is being created when you, when you draw this curve. So those points that, that we that we that are shown there, let me see it. Those are the parameters that represent a single stroke in the in a piece of text. Um, okay, and down here, after we find the coefficients, and we have represented the the curve, the strokes, each stroke. We set this is this, this becomes the input to the machine learning model. One second. Let's see. Okay. Um so what I was showing you before. Um that's 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 what's happening here. So you have the strokes being drawn at the bottom. Just as they're working, they are being transformed into cubic Bezier curves. And they're being fed into the machine learning model. And then that machine learning model is creating the classification, uh, the prediction or the prediction of what characters or what letters are being are being represented by the handwriting. The bottom one here is segment and decode. The difference to look out for is the text at the bottom comes after some time, meaning the the model is first wanting to get a big chunk of what you've written, then it segments it and then uh, spits out the, 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 the text. You see, for example, the word segment, we first write it and then wait, then it's, it's put there. And then, um, and then you, as you write, it, it's basically there's big latency. When you look at the upper one, which is the result of the paper we're describing, um, it's happening almost in real time. Um, Basically, it keeps up with, with what you're handwriting. Okay, so now that we've, we've discussed the 
the input and how the input is processed. Uh, we're going to look at how the model is structured, uh, how the model works at a high level, and how it's trained and how and the experimentation. I now realize one hour is not a very big chunk of time, <laughs> but but um, so the model, let me get the structure of the model. Um, here, this image. So everything we've been discussing so far is the input. Basically, get the, the, the set of points in space and then put them, make them cubic Bezier's and then uh, parameterize them and send them into the model. So the model, the machine learning model we're working with is a neural network, uh, a, recur a recurrent neural network which is a, an, it's represented as a set of bi bidirectional recurrent layers. These layers, one, two, three, and four in the image, are LSTMs. LSTM means long short term memory, which is a kind of recurrent neural network that tries to capture context in sequential data. So it's very popular in, in language models because how language is interpreted the, the meaning of something time, for example, this sentence, if, if, if you have a model that is trying to predict the next word, in this sentence, the next word, uh, it needs to know, it might need to know some context from long before where we are to, to figure out what the current word is. And that's, that's a very high level explanation of what LSTMs are. And recurrent neural networks are just uh, uh, networks that that, that feed uh, they feed their result back into the they sort of create loops in the in the layers of, of the, the the neural network, and that's how they they're able to use the context of previously learned things when trying to learn a current a current uh, result or prediction, and the bi bidirectional. The arrows you see here means instead of learning from just the back, it also learns from the front. So let's say you're predicting this text here, match the length of the ink. You when you're when you're at length, you have you're using the information you learned before, but then later on in the future when you're at 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 ink or at, at such, you can change your mind about length and, and change the whole word, the whole word there. Let me see if, 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 if it makes sense here. If you look at this video still, um, it first writes a J. I don't know, when you see it start, it first writes a J, but then in the future, it turns it into F. Um, do you see that? It turns it into F. So it, it's changing the text that was already predicted before, after it learns things from the future, the future meaning the more you wrote, it went back into, into time so to say, and changed its, its prediction. That is, that is now the bidirectional nature of this, that it's learning from what's happening before, what's happening after to make the correct, the correct prediction. This is, like I said, uh, one, it's, it's very it's standard, quote unquote, meaning if you're doing, if you're trying to, to classify sequential data, um, you most likely use recurrent networks because of their context. And then you will use LSTMs, which is a kind of recurrent neural networks uh, to try and un understand or gain meaning and predict the text. So these models are created as LSTMs. And you have your input layer and then a series of, of, of layers that are LSTMs in long short term memory layers and then when they're trained using CTC laws, CTC would be uh, connectionist temporal classification laws. I don't think we have the time to describe what this means, but the output of the LSTMs is a probability distribution of the characters, what characters uh, exist in the text you're writing. And then we use this, this model, this loss, to figure out which one we want or which one you care about the most. Okay. 
so mm, that's that's how that's how that's how the model works at a high level. I think it, it would be best to to read through or to have another time to, to explain the model at a much higher in more detail. But basically that's how it works and, and I've shown you visually what what it looks like. And the training, like I said, uh, we use the CTC laws, which I won't try to describe here because of time. And then they they did um, they did some tuning of the weights of the decoder weights using in in Google's Vizier. This is this is I think right now it's a different system used by Google to do to do to train machine learning models and to tune them. And then after that, uh, the fourth section of the paper goes in detail about how this performs compared to other previously done uh, implementations. So if I zoom into this 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 uh, table here, the performance the performance of of uh, not that table this table the performance of this model uh, this uh, compared to other work that has been done before. So. So this work, if you look here, we're having a lower character error rate. CER stands for character error rate, meaning uh, when the model predicts that the character is say A, B, how wrong is it compared to other models that have come before? And WER stands for word error rate. And the takeaway from this is the accuracy, the accuracy of, of the model compared to previous work is not necessarily better it's it's it, it competes it matches or it, it at least it at least works as as good as what we had before the only difference is in speed which as they say in the paper the speed of, of prediction predicting handwriting recognition uh is is, is much higher and, and I, I hope you would be able to see it on the videos i've been sharing but this this the bottom one is slower which is a segment and decode it waits for you to write a bit more before it, it decodes, whereas this one is near real time. It matches the description of online handwriting recognition. Um, so the, the last bit of the paper is basically benchmarking and, and comparing the different, uh, comparing it to previous work that has been done on various data sets. And then, um, and then um, the performance. In the performance, they note that uh, the model that, that I'm describing now uses significantly less layers. It uses a, it's a much smaller model. So if, if you're using it in an app, like they use it in Gboard, you have a much smaller APK file on Android, and it, it, it runs much faster too. And the intuition of how it runs much faster is what I was describing. The Bezier curve may have fewer points to work with, instead of the many raw points that you have, you have only a few points. And then, um, and then you have a smaller model. Um, another detail that, that, that they mention in, in a summary that I read, I will share the links, is they, they work with TensorFlow, but in production, they use TensorFlow Lite to have, that's how they have a smaller model. And then, uh, as you can see here, this is being used to to do uh, to translate over 102 languages in, in 26 scripts. A script, a script is, for example, a script is I can think of it as an alphabet. And we have multiple languages that use Latin script. What we are reading, uh, you could write Swahili using the same set of, of symbols that are used in English. So that would be that's that's one script. So multiple languages can share a script. In this paper, I haven't gone into the multi-language part because of time. But basically, this is that is what this work is about. And the takeaway is uh, 
this this work uses cubic Bezier curves as input to a machine learning model, um, a neural network, a recurrent neural network that uses LSTMs to do fast handwriting recognition, fast online handwriting recognition. Yeah, I think we can run through some questions now. If you're, if you're still on. Sounds good. Uh, I think you can just raise your hand if you have a question, but we have a few on the on the chat. I don't know if you can access the chat right now. When you end or should I read it for you? Uh, it's okay. I can read, I can read. Uh, the two actually were for me. <laughs> so, uh, uh, letter T. When you're writing T, are those like combine the Bezier curves? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Small t. Mm. A, sm a small t. So, yeah, so something, and that's something I hoped I would talk about more, but that's time right now. So, if you have a small t like this, this t is made up of two strokes uh, that stroke and that Oops. stroke. Mm -hmm. And then, so these strokes are then land. They, they have they remember the time variable I talked about. So, T will be equal to zero, time is equal to zero, and maybe this is five. And then this is higher up because you write it like that. This is like uh, six and be eight. So T is made up of two strokes that uh, are then represented as the vehicles and and passed into the, the model. Now, um, you could have a longer word. Like when people are writing, they don't, they don't necessarily write uh, separated letters like that you could if you draw it cast is like segment this is one curve now you see this is one curve the, the model wouldn't wouldn't uh wouldn't try to split it because it doesn't know where to split what it would try to do uh to try to fit the cubic bezier onto this data so you can imagine these as being random points in space uh so it will try to fit a cubic Bezier, and then when it fails, that is the error. The, the error it's getting is very high. It starts trying to it starts segmenting, cutting, cutting up that, cutting up that curve into pieces, and then those pieces uh, it tries to fit to fit them as cubic Beziers too, and that's how it would separate a long curve like this, it's one curve because it's scarcely into simpler curves. And so even if a letter can be S uh, or S, we can create it either, either a Bezier, but we can, maybe this doesn't fit to a single Bezier curve. It would be broken into two, two curves, such as when you're writing it, it was, it was made up of a single stroke like this, but how the, the model is ingesting it is as two strokes. The difference is these are actually Bezier curves, cubic Bezier. What you wrote is a series of points. Yeah. Nice. Uh, any other question from the team? Uh, as I read, my last one was around. Uh, I was just a comment. I'm guessing the model adapts to different users' handwriting, or does it mean that the training still goes on as we use the app? Yes, the, the model generalizes handwriting. So uh, in the in the training data, you could have multiple versions of S. They're all called, they're all referred to as S, the letter S. And mm -hmm. and that's how it would generalize to multiple handwritings. You didn't have the time to go into the details of how how the continuous sequence of input turns into discrete characters. But yes, the answer is yes to that question. Oh, that was good. Right, yeah, frankly, go ahead and ask. Is it Dennis or Frank? Uh, it's Franklin. Let's start with Franklin. When we reduce the number of points, um, can it affect the accuracy of the um, the accuracy of the model? Because I think when we have more data. Mm, it can 
it can improve the accuracy of the model. That's my question. Oh, so you're saying, yeah. So let me, I think I understand the question. And, and that question is at the heart of, of the optimization that we're doing. And so let me just spend some time showing you. So when you write, when you write C, how the computer is looking at it is a series of, of points. If you zoom in here, okay, that's not good. You have a, so these two things, these two things are equivalent. This and this are equal. The only difference is here you have many more points and they're detailed. But that's also a problem when you're trying to to to, to predict. Like I started out a couple of So what we do, what why we're using Bezier cards is we're still trying to say C, but using much fewer points. So the Bezier points, the control points, are not are not are not even on the on the arc of the, the letter itself, but they describe the letter. So if I show you here, for example, the points I'm talking about are the orange ones. So as you can see, they describe the black line, which is C. They're not doing, they're not showing, they're not, they're not necessarily following the arc, but they are getting the, but they're, they're getting the arc of the C and they're just four of them. Now, starting out, I described how that works, but you, the answer is you don't lose you don't lose any data. You represent the same thing, the same thing that you're saying, for example, letter C, but using much fewer points, and this is misleading. These points would be, in this case, even farther away from that curve, using tangents like that. But the curve that they draw when you work out the, the algebra is the same thing. I hope that that answers at least vaguely what you're asking. But the answer is we don't lose any data when we when we use less points because there are different kinds of points. One are control points of a cubic Bezier curve. The other were literal row points of the the path drawn out by the curve or by the stroke. So, uh, before I hand it over to our lead. Uh, issues here. I want to the last question from Gideon is can it handle doctor's handwriting? Can it can it handle? It's, I didn't get the last bit. Uh doctor's handwriting. <laughs> um a doctor so bad handwriting you <laughs> mean yes it can be generalized because a doctor's handwriting still or any bad write, handwriting is is still um, a, a series of strokes in some way right so we would have to train the model on that handwriting too uh but ultimately it would be then turned into bezier curves and then it would handle it so further work or if you're trying to improve the model that would fit in the improvement of the model say we have the model it works but it doesn't handle bad handwriting we just use more examples from the data set to include other kinds of, of symbols. And in fact, yes, you could make up a language, like you could, you could, for example, train it to, obviously, train it to identify different shapes that are not necessarily in the Latin script or any other script for that matter to mean other things. And that way you, you'd, even, you'd create a different handwriting. So yeah, it can <laughs> she train me. Okay. Is there any other question? If, if there are no more questions, uh, thank you so much, Victor. It was such a good uh, presentation. Uh, very very insightful. Um, thank you for everyone for attending and the questions that were submitted. Uh, we currently don't have uh, 
a paper to discuss for next month. So we are looking for uh, presenters and paper suggestions. So if you have any, please share them with us and we'll organize the next one. Uh, am I correct on that one, uh, Ruth, Anthony? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so if you have any any paper recommendations, please send them over. And with that note, I'd like to release you uh, to end the meeting there. We have four minutes over time. Sorry for that. And thank you so much. All right, thank you. Thank you.